Okay, I promised uh, when we started off this chapter that we would find an equivalent rotational form to, well, uh, an analogous rotational form to Newton's second law. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about here. Start off, let's do a demonstration. This is a demonstration of the moment of inertia. I have here two rods, one red, one blue. And um, I want to first demonstrate that these rods have the same mass, about 1.15 kilograms for the red one. And 1.15 kilograms for the blue one. But the mass in these rods is distributed differently. In the blue one, the mass is distributed near the ends. And in fact, you can see here that there's, that there's mass covering these holes. And if I use all of my amazing strength to try and rotate this as fast as I can, this is as fast as it goes for me. It's hard to get started rotating because the mass is farther away from the axis of rotation, which is along the line of my forearm. As opposed to, for this red rod, the mass is, is not out here at the ends, but instead it's here uh, concentrated very close to my hand and clo concentrated close to the axis of rotation. Very easy to turn this, very easy to, to start the motion. And um, so this, this helps, uh, hopefully helps you understand that moment of inertia acts like mass, but for rotations. It's harder to get this one moving, I mean harder to get the blue one moving than the red one because it has, because the blue one has a much larger moment of inertia. It's moment of inertia. Okay, so what we saw in that video is that the, the farther th that mass is concentrated from the axis of rotation, the harder it is to, to, to get any kind of angular acceleration on it. And the higher the moment of inertia. So uh, we introduced the, the concept of the moment of inertia in that demo video. Here we'll put some teeth into it. State the rotational form of Newton's second law and define the moment of inertia. Now this, I hope, will look to you similar to the net force is mass times acceleration. Here are the analogous quantities. We're replacing acceleration with angular acceleration that we talked about in the last chapter. We're replacing mass with what's known as the moment of inertia. And then we're replacing the net force by the net torque. So no longer are we in Kansas. The, the net torque is not going to be zero. Sorry. It's going to be equal to the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. So that is Newton's second law for rotations, so-called. Now the moment of inertia is defined this way. It is the sum of all of the masses in the system times their radiuses uh, squared. And by radius, we mean how far they are from the axis of rotation. So, um, so for a situation like this, if we had a, a, a plane of mass m, and it's some distance from the axis of rotation r, then the moment of inertia for that system would be the mass of the plane times the distance of this radius squared. So we'll do some examples just to see how this how it works out. Particle mass is in kilograms, radius is in meters squared. But what this does, this moment of inertia, is that it, it tells you that the farther you are away from the axis of rotation, the greater the moment of inertia is. 
And that moment of, uh, moment of inertia is the resistance of an object to turning motion in the same way that mass is the resistance of an object to translational motion. Okay, an example. Two particles, each have mass m, and are fixed at the ends of a thin rod, thin rigid rod of length l. Find the moment of inertia when this object rotates relative to an axis that A is at one end of the rod that is A at one end of the rod and B at its center. Okay, so we have a rod of a particular length L and we're going to put one of the masses here at one end of the rod and one of the masses at the other end of the rod and we're going to consider the rod to be massless. So we're only considering the mass of these two pieces. So think of it as a dumbbell with a uh, very thin piece of metal between the two pieces of uh, two masses at the ends. And in this case, uh, for part A, I'm going to uh, rotate the rod about one of its ends. So it's going to rotate around like this. And in this case, I have exactly the same rod, the same masses, the same length, but I'm going to rotate it about its center. So let's calculate the moment of inertia in both cases. Um, in case A, we need to add up all the masses in the system times their radius is squared. So mass 1 radius mass 1 times r1 squared plus mass 2 times r2 squared. Well, what about for r1? So for mass 1, the distance of that mass, distance between that mass and the axis of rotation is 0 because it's sitting right on the axis of rotation. So that's why we get um, r1 equal to 0 in that case. For r2, for m2, this mass is at the end of that rod. The rod has length L and its distance of this mass from the axis of rotation is just L, the length of the rod. So that's why we get this. So the total moment of inertia is M times L squared. What happens if we rotate about the center? Okay, so the center of the rod here is the axis of rotation. Well, I've got to take M1 times R1 squared. M1 is just M. Both masses have the same mass. Um, times R1. That's the distance between this mass and this axis. Well, the total distance here is L. And so this half distance here must be L over 2. So it's L over 2 squared. Now some students have trouble at this point and they say, well, shouldn't, since this is on the left side, shouldn't we be putting a minus sign by this one in here? The answer is no. That um, lever arm is squared. It's kind of like kinetic energies. They're never negative. They're always positive. So we're always going to put these in. We don't have to worry about directions. Um, and what side of the axis it's on when you're doing moment of inertia. All you have to do is add up the mass times the, dis the radius squared for each object. Well, this is for mass 1. For mass 2, we've got it over here. It's also a distance L over 2, and so it's just going to be M times L over 2 quantity squared. Well, L over 2 squared is L squared over 4. We have ML squared over 4 for this term plus ML squared over 4 for this term. And we add those two terms together and we get 2ML squared over 4. And 2 over 4 is 1 half. So we end up with a smaller moment of inertia in this case. Why? Because these masses are located closer to the axis of rotation. Just like in the, the demo with the, the red and blue wands, uh, the closer we brought that mass in, the smaller the moment of inertia and the, uh, l the less the resistance to turning motion. OK. 
Okay. Um, demonstration of the principal axes of rotation. You can do this with any object. It's really fun. Every solid, rigid body has three principal axes of rotation. For this block of wood, the axis of rotation that passes through these two points, means that it's rotating this way, is the smallest axis, uh, is the axis of rotation that has the smallest moment of inertia. The one passing through here, these two points that I've labeled two, has the intermediate moment of inertia. And then the one passing through this face here on both sides has the largest moment of inertia. The principal axis that has the intermediate, not the largest and not the smallest, moment of inertia always uh, is unstable. So you can rotate around uh, this smallest, uh, the axis with the smallest moment of inertia like that, and, it's, and the motion is stable. There may be a little bit of wobble. But it's going to basically maintain uh, its orientation. Also, through the one with the largest moment of inertia, Like that, it's also stable. But the one that passes uh, the principal axis that has the intermediate, neither the largest nor the smallest, no matter how hard you try, you're not going to be able to get a stable rotation. Let me do, do my best. And what you see is that it starts flopping in, an, in other directions. So that one's the unstable principal axis of rotation. OK. We've talked about how to calculate moments of inertia for, for point masses. Uh, but that demo uh, that we just showed illustrates the fact that uh, solid objects can have different moments of inertia depending on what axis you run them through. And here's another couple of um, solid objects for which you can calculate the moment of inertia. You won't be expected to calculate these, but, um, but to understand where they come from. This is the moment of inertia of a thin-walled hollow cylinder or hoop, a ring. Um, so something with its mass concentrated out at, at the rim. And its moment of inertia is simply mr squared. And that's actually where m is the mass, the total mass. And that one's pretty easy to understand. Why? Because if we divided this up into a bunch of little masses, and then we added up the moment of inertia uh, for each of those mr squareds, the r's are all going to be the same, because all the mass is concentrated on the rim. And so You'll add up mr squared uh, plus for the first little bit of mass, plus mr squared for the next little bit of mass, plus mr squared for the next bit of mass. All those r squareds are going to be the same. Factor out the r squareds, and all you end up with is the mass, mass 1 plus mass 2 plus mass 3, et cetera. And that, that sum of those masses will just give you the total mass. So that's why the, um, for a hoop, the moment of inertia it's just equal to the total mass of the hoop times its radius. And again, we're, we're thinking of it as not having any thickness. All the mass is concentrated at that radius. What happens for a solid cylinder or a disk? Well, not all the mass is concentrated out at the outside. There's some halfway there, and there's some right here in the middle. But the closer the mass is concentrated to the axis of rotation, the less of an effect it has on the moment of inertia. 
So you end up, if you do the calculation, which we won't go through, and I won't expect you to do, is actually one half times the total mass of that disk times the radius squared. And the thing just to remember is that the reason this one is smaller than this one is that for a disk, some of the mass is concentrated closer to the axis, and it doesn't um, contribute as much toward the moment of inertia. All right, so here's a demonstration of that moment of inertia. Demonstrate the effect of moment of inertia on a rolling disk. This is a solid disk. It has moment of inertia one half m, the mass, r, the radius, squared. One half m r squared for this solid disk. This is a ring of material. It's hollow in the center. All of its mass is concentrated at the outer radius. The radii of these two are the same, but this one has a moment of inertia of mr squared. So it has a, a larger moment of inertia, assuming the masses of these two objects are the same. The masses of these two objects, in fact, are not the same, but as it turns out, when you do the calculation, the mass cancels out of the ca calculation. And what matters is the radius, which is the same, and the distribution of the mass uh, between the center and the outside. So uh, we're going to release both of these from rest at the top of this inclined plane and ask which one of them wins uh, the trip to the bottom. Will it be the one with the larger moment of inertia, mr squared, or the one with the smaller moment of inertia, one half mr squared? So as you can see, the winner is the one with the smaller moment of inertia. Why is that? And the reason is that it has less resistance to turning motion because it has a smaller moment of inertia. So moment of inertia acts a lot like, uh, moment of inertia for rotational motion acts a lot like the mass for translational motion. The bigger the mass, the slower it is to start up. The bigger the, bigger the moment of inertia, the slower it is to start turning. That's moment of inertia. Uh, just one more uh, comment about this one. The, um, we know that the Newton's second law for rotations states this. If you just assume that both of these disks have the same mass, then the torque that's, that's causing them to turn is actually provided by the static friction force. If there were no static friction, these wouldn't start to roll. They would just slide down the, the plane. So it's static friction. But static friction um, is going to be the same for both if they both have the same mass. And so if the torque, the net torque on both of them is the same, and if the moment of inertia of the disk is less for the solid cylinder than it is for the hoop, a lower moment of inertia will mean that to get the same torque, the angular acceleration has to be greater. So that basically says that um, the higher the moment of inertia, the more difficult it is to accelerate, ang do an, an angular rotational acceleration. And, um, and that explains why the hoop is slower. It's got a larger moment of inertia, and its acceleration is less in order to give the same torque.